I just wanted to do a quick poll. Who here has seen like uh, fusions like this in their fellowship so far? One, two. How about uh, kyphoplasty? Is that stuff that you guys are seeing a lot of? Okay. Um, I know for sure you guys are going to be doing this. There's a lot of stuff that you'll learn in this practice in, in this. Uh, course that you may or may not do when you're done, but this is bread and butter. Um, so there's some pearls about stuff that you for sure will encounter uh, once you start practice. Just briefly, the indications for a neurotomy. This is going to be your axial neck or low back pain. Um, these are patients who have failed conservative treatment with physical therapy, you know, anti-inflammatories. Um, insurance requires you to do two different diagnostic blocks, two different anesthetics. Um, and to localize which joints are going to be the, the cause of your pain. Um, you know, contraindications are the same for pretty much any interventional procedure, infection, pregnancy, um, inadequate response to your blocks. So I kind of labeled this talk more like the four commandments of radiofrequency ablation. Know thy anatomy, know thy imaging, know thy needle tip geospatially, and develop thy protocol. Dr. Beale said something, and you'll hear a lot of these people talk about, if you know your anatomy, you can work your way around things. And the most important thing for you to know is that you have to know your anatomy. Um, so throughout this fellowship year, study your anatomy, burn it into your brain. Um, I, I do recommend working in three dimensions. Get a spine model, look at it, get needles, figure out you know how does this correlate to what my x-ray picture looks like. So um, know your anatomy. Um, good procedural technique is driven by understanding your anatomy in 3D. So when we're thinking about the cervical spine, you know, your, your main views when you're doing um, radiofrequency ablation is that you have to know where the medial branches lie. Um, very commonly, you're going to be treating C3, C4, and C5. This is just going to be your axial neck pain that doesn't radi radiate into the top of the head or down to the shoulders. So these are your most common areas. Um, so there's, there's, I don't expect you guys to you know, remember where everything is at this point. You just have to study your anatomy, um, understand your landmarks, and understand how this applies to your floral. Um, when we're looking at the lateral view here, we have, I don't know if there's a, a pointer up here or not. There we go. Um, the third occipital nerve, this is uh, very commonly a nerve that you're going to ablate when you're having cervicogenic headaches, so pain that's reading up into the occiput. This is a super common. Um, you'll have, I commonly have patients who are getting treated for migraines who are on five different migraine medications, and they come to you, and it just turns out that they have either thought occipital neuralgia or occipital neuralgia. So it's a huge um, service to patients when they're on like polypharmacy being treated for what's not really a migraine. Um, so I always think thought occipital nerve for patients with uh, posterior headache pain. Um, and then the medial branches come along the articular pillars here, thought occipital nerve. C3 kind of runs along the superior aspect um, of the articular pillar. C4 is a little bit more um, inferior. C5 is kind of midline. So you can always remember C5 usually runs midline long, um, and they go superior up. Um, when we're thinking about our fluoro, as we just talked about before, C5 is kind of a slap dab in the middle. C4 is a little bit more superior. C3 is up. These are probably your most commonly treated areas. And these are some of the referral patterns that you get uh, in terms of where patients are going to have uh, pain referring from which joint. So C2, 3, the thyroid occipital nerve is going to come up here. Um, I don't really find it super commonly that people are having lower facetogenic pain. Generally, pain down into this area is going to be from like a C7 radiculopathy. But you can get it. Just know, know your referral patterns. Um, the medial branches innervate the... Uh, Obviously, the, the facet joint, the multifidus muscles, interspinal ligaments, and a small patch of skin over the joint. Um, this is from the uh, Spine Intervention Society textbook, but they superimposed uh, wires that ran over each of the medial branch nerves, and then they superimposed where the nerve lies. So, you know, there's some variability in where the nerve actually runs. Um, you can mediate some of this by doing two burns or adjusting your needle. So when you uh, are getting your needles placed, it's, you know, you're going off of cadaveric studies. The needle, the, the nerve is not always in the exact same position. You know the, you know, approximate position. Um, so just understand that uh, you're, you're, you're dealing with patients where you think you know where the nerve is and you need to make sure that you're going to actually cover the nerve. Um, when you're looking at the, the AP view, this is another just schematic about, you know, approximately where the nerve lies um, in relationship to where you are. So just uh, things to think about. It's not like the textbook where it's one dot. Um, know that imaging. 
uh, how many of how many of you guys have X-ray techs that have your images set up when you're when you're in when you guys are in training? Just raise your hand if you have an X-ray tech who sets up. Yeah. Yeah, so when I started practice, I had to train my medical assistant to run my C-arm. Um, the biggest piece of advice I could give you is try to try to run your C-arm as a fellow as much as your, your attending will let you. <laughs> because you'll come out and uh, you have to start taking your own pictures. And if you can't get your picture right, then you, you can't get your needle in the right spot. So you really, really have to get good at understanding that you can't, that you have to be able to move your picture, you have to be able to get the picture right, or else you're not, you don't really know what you're doing. So understand your uh, your fluoroscopy, learn to look at your landmarks that you're gonna use every single time to count where exactly you're gonna be in the neck or in the lumbar spine. Um, one of the ones I really like to use is just the one, two joint here. This always tells you find the dens, one, two. Um, as soon as you do that, you know exactly where you are, and then you can find the waist of the articular pillars about where, where you're going to go, because your AP view is where you're going to start, you're going to oblique over, and you're going to start driving your needles. So you can look up. If you can find the dens in one, two, you, you know where you are. <clears throat> um, yeah, so you're initially going to start with your AP, figure out where you are, and then go from there. Um, the other, you know, this picture just sort of demonstrates when you're Tilting your C-arm, you can accentuate um, the lateral masses if you're trying to go for more parallel placement of your electrode to get over your nerve. So um, you're going to have to learn to optimize what picture works for you and how that's going to get your needle exactly where you want it to be um, over your nerves. Um, your criteria for your true lateral of your C-spine, the transverse process occupies the posterior superior quadrant of the vertebral body. The disc spates have to be clear. Half the vertebral canal is evident between the articular pillars and the base of the spinous process, and the articular pillars of both sides are superimposed. So you really need to be able to get this picture um, because as soon as you're dry, if you don't have a correct lateral, then you could be someplace you really don't want to be. So yeah, my biggest advice for, for your fellowship training is try to take over the C-arm, maybe even run the C-arm, try to understand your pictures. Um, how to think of your lateral where, you know, it's easy to kind of forget what's actually going on in your anatomy. So, you know, you have your vertebral artery and you've got, um, you've got the spinal nerves coming out. So when you're, when you're looking at the picture, superimpose, you know, what do you want to avoid causing catastrophic damage, harming the patient? So you always need to know your safety views. You need to, you need to know where do I not want to go so that we can do this procedure and not have some sort of complications. So, um, always remember um, how you can you can hurt someone and take you know mitigate your risks for all of your procedures by understanding you know what's on your what what is your fluoro actually telling you um, know that needle tip uh, you know I think they covered some of the different types of probes that can be used for RF um, a lot of times you're just going to be getting these ellipsoid burns around your RF needle so the concept is that you want to have parallel placement of your needle tip so that you're covering the longest portion of the nerve as possible. Generally, you're gonna be doing this um, from a posterior approach. Some people come from a lateral approach, but then unless you have some sort of tip that's causing a, a projection of your burn, you're not really gonna get a good lesion. So you really wanna to try to get parallel placement. Um, like here's, here's an example. If you're coming from a lateral approach in the cervical spine and the nerve is, um, there's a high probability that you might not get a good lesion. So know what your needle tip is, know what type of burn it, it's going to go, and you want to try to get as parallel to the nerve as possible. Um, this is out of Furman. Hopefully you guys have this textbook. Everyone's neck will look like this in practice, I promise you. Um, but yeah, this is like a classic example. Find your C1, 2, find the dens. You have three, four, five. Uh, this is obviously coming down a trajectory view. You want to come down, touch os, you know where your depth is. And then once you've uh, gotten all three of your needles placed and you have, have touched off, then you go switch to your lateral view. Once again, just demonstrating the spinal nerves and the vertebral artery here. Um, and this prevents you from going too deep. So your general protocol, you obtain your AP view, use the same landmarks to orient yourself to your anatomy every single time. You have to learn how to have a process for yourself, identify where you are. Uh, once you've identified and if you're comfortable, you know where you are, then you can start to fine tune your image, oblique and caudal tilt to try to get your needle to be parallel. Um, then you drive your needle to os, rotate the lateral, fine tune and motor test. 
Uh, your complications with the cervical spine, you can have, you know, for, same for any procedure that you're really going to get. Vasovagal, um, you can get a neuritis from this. Not super common, but if you get a little bit too close to the, to the DRG, you can get some, um, some post-RFA neuritis. Uh, it's common for patients to have uh, cutaneous loss in that section of the, the neck. This sometimes will patients will complain of a sunburn type sensation. Um, you can get some ataxia and numbness when you do a third occipital nerve. It's very common when you're doing medial branch blocks of the third occipital nerve that patients will have some sort of vertigo, which is normal um, for a few hours. I just wanted to include this. This was the first spine RFA I did out of fellowship. <laughs> so this, this I, I saw this and I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so you're, you're not going to have clean, you know, you're going to have your clean anatomy. You're also going to have anatomy that's extremely difficult to find your way through. So the only way you're going to be able to navigate that is uh, when you have a protocol and you can trust, uh, you know, where you, where you are in the anatomy and understand that you're dealing with three-dimensional structures. So um, really, really understand your anatomy and it'll make your job much easier. Um, know that anatomy for the lumbar spine. The medial branches are a little bit oriented a little bit differently. It's the, the level at and level above that innervates the joint. So for L5, S1, L4, L5, which is your most commonly level treated levels, it's L3, L4, and L5, armory dorsal ramus, which is going to be where you're going to be going. Um, they, they lie, you know, right in fear to the superior, superior articular process. Uh, this should be bread and butter for, for most of the fellows in here. Like, you just have to understand where these nerves live. And you have to get comfortable uh, orienting your fluoro to get parallel placement of your RF probe over where the nerve lives. <clears throat> uh, not too much different in terms of what the medial branch is innervating in the lumbar spine, only that they're oriented differently. So you're, again, L3 and L4 of medial would innervate L4, 5, and so on. Uh, your target acquisition, you're going to oblique over to the side that you're um, trying to treat. You're looking like right at the base of the superior articular process. Um, you're gonna, generally, you're going to be able to get at least L, um, L3 and L4 in the, same, uh, in the same picture. Sometimes you have to fine tune for each one. And, um, L5 is a little bit different. You generally can come from a more um, AP straight on view. There's no mammillary accessory ligament there. So you generally want to oblique for L4 and L3 medial branches because you want to avoid the mammal accessory ligament. Um, demonstrated here where you want to come in a little bit more oblique so you can actually get across where the nerve lives. Otherwise, you can be obstructed by the ligament here. But for L5, there's no ligament, so you can come in from a more uh, AP view. Um, once you have your oblique needle touched down to os, you can fine tune in your safety view. Make sure you're not protruding into the foramen. Um, and of course, you do your sensory and motor testing and make sure that you're not getting any paresthesias down the leg. Um, I just included this last slide. This is from um, studies from a psychological journal, the Psychology of Optimal Experience, that talks about flow and flow state. They've shown that people who have the highest amounts of meaning in their life are in the flow state as long as they, uh, most often in the flow state. And so I saw this and I was like, this pretty much encapsulates what your experience is like in medicine, but also as a fellow. Um, but as you go from low to high challenge, your anxiety levels go from low to high. And as, you're, as you go from uh, low skill to high skill, you can find yourself finely tuned and you want to finally tune yourself in the channel. So continue to challenge yourself. You're going to have situations of high anxiety. Find your flow state. This is, like the, best, this is the best specialty to be in, I think, in medicine. So yeah, so that's what I got for you. <clears throat> Okay, well, we are...